Anybody need a copy of our present outline? Will we know one another after death? There they are. I knew I had some up here already, but I put them in a different place. <clears throat> we had just begun looking at this possibility as to whether or not we'll know one another after death in our studies up to this point. Uh, we presented uh, what I believe scriptures indicate about uh, especially the um, whereabouts of uh, the righteous uh, who have gone on uh, from this life, uh, that they may well be, uh, well, as Paul says, with the Lord, with Christ, and Christ in heaven, but also presented in the last uh, study uh, the different passages indicate that uh, those that have gone on before are conscience of uh, their environment, their existence, and uh, that type of thing. And then that leads then to this particular study, uh, will we know one another after death? And opened up with that Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 15 to verse 23 passage where uh, David uh, lamenting uh, the fact that this child that was born um, from uh, his relationship with Bathsheba, uh, that the child was going to die uh, as a consequence uh, basically of David's sin and David said that uh, he realized that the child couldn't be brought back but uh, he would uh, go to where that child is and it just um, indicates uh, from that passage uh, to me that uh, he was uh, living at that time in hope of uh, seeing that child once again, recognizing that child once again. But that's not the only passage uh, we uh, indicated. Uh, it just kind of a uh, kind of a um, uh, passage that indicates that maybe uh, this uh, is the case that we uh, suggest that we recognize one another after death. Now we did look at Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, beginning our studies and in that passage uh, we uh, saw that the king of Babylon would be recognized after death according to the statements that were made uh, there and uh, says that he would be recognized in Hades and uh, if if the translation was a Greek translation, Hades, the New Testament word, Sheol actually was the word in the Old Testament time, but the realm of the dead, it'd be recognized in other words. And then the next passage we're going to be looking at is found in Ezekiel chapter 32. And uh, we'll see here that uh, this passage uh, contains lamentation uh, for uh, favor of the king of uh, Egypt and also uh, his army and it speaks of Pharaoh and his army uh, who's recognized by others uh, sometimes say in hell but the point is in the realm of the dead and uh, just another evidence that we'll look at and also another one in the same passage Ezekiel chapter 32 Pharaoh in turn recognizes those of Assyria and Elam and Meshach Tubal and Edom and we'll look at those two passages beginning our studies here this morning Let's begin with a word of prayer, though. Most holy and divine Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for this time that we can come together with others like faith and study your word and learn from your word and your revelation and pray, Father, that much fruit might come from our studies this hour. We're thankful, Father, for the local church arrangement you blessed us with and the encouragement we drive from our fellowship with one another. And thankful, Father, for the time we'll have to come together before you in worship. And pray, Father, that 
uh, all the things that are said and done will serve to encourage us and build us up in the most holy faith. And pray, Father, that we'll be diligent in uh, our learning, uh, take these things to others around about us, uh, so that others can know of your great truths also to be your will. We're thankful, Holy Father, for the many spiritual blessings we enjoy in Christ. Uh, we're thankful for the redemption we have, the Jesus shed blood upon the cross, and as you continue to forgive us of our sins as we continue to live in the light of your truths. We're mindful, Father, of those who are gone because of sickness, uh, those that have health issues, ongoing health issues, uh, mindful of those that recovering from surgery and pray and be with them all and uh, provide them the restoration of health that they need and uh, provide them the comfort uh, and the encouragement they need in uh, times of sickness and times of trial. We ask, Father, that you'd be uh, with us all in our daily activities of life as we strive to apply your word to our, uh, to our daily activities and be a influence for good in the community in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's look at this passage in Ezekiel chapter 32, uh, verse 17 through verse 21, where it appears Pharaoh, and also we'll look at verse 31, his army would be recognized after after death. And let's see, Donna, if, you want, if you're there, you want to uh, read Ezekiel 32, 17 through 21, and then also verse 31. Okay. It came to pass also in the twelfth year, on the fifteenth day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, well over the multitude of Egypt, and cast them down to the depth of the earth, her and the daughters of the famous nations, with those who go down to the pit. Whom do you surpass pass in beauty, go down and be placed with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of those slain by the sword, and she is delivered to the sword, drawing her in all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell, with those who help him. They have gone down, they lie down, they lie with the uncircumcised slain by the sword. And then he said, and then you read verse 31? And not that's what I'm going, that's what I was trying to okay. remember which one right. you said. Sure. It's not on there. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all his multitude. Pharaoh and all his armies, slain by the sword, says the Lord God. So the context, when you look back in the uh, first part of Ezekiel 32, it's a, it's a lamentation for the uh, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, uh, and uh, you see in verse 31, includes his army also, all of his entourage, uh, basically. But looking at the passage, to notice that it speaks of Pharaoh and his army uh, being recognized by others. Now, the New King James Version uses the term hell, but it's the realm of the dead is the point. Uh, verse 31, especially uh, there saying uh, that Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword are the ones that are subject to this, to this lamentation. And then going right to the next uh, point uh, in the same passage, we see that Pharaoh in turn recognizes those of Assyria, Elam, uh, Meshach, and Tubal, and Edom. Uh, and it won't take time to read verse 22 on down to verse 30, but you can see that there's a lamentation against Assyria, verse 22, a lamentation against Elam, verse 24, a lamentation against Meshach and Tubal, which uh, we believe would uh, be the peoples of Russia, uh, uh, what we identify as peoples of Russia today, in verse 26, and then uh, verse 29, a lamentation uh, against those of uh, of Edom, uh, they're going to be going the same place that Pharaoh, king of Egypt's going. But then verse thirty two uh, says uh, Pharaoh, or verse thirty one says Pharaoh will see them and he'll be comforted over all his multitude. Don't think of the idea of him being comforted in the sense of being in bliss and uh, being a pleasant place. He's comforted in seeing that. He's not the only one that's gone this way. Uh, he has company uh, here in this realm of, of the dead. But he recognizes them. He recognizes all the uh, great leaders of these, uh, in the past, great nations, and they've all befallen the same, 
the same fate. Uh, verse 32, um, God says, I have caused my terror in the land of the living, and uh, he that is Pharaoh shall be placed in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword. Pharaoh and all his multitude, uh, says the Lord God. Now realize these are negative examples uh, of this possibility uh, that uh, we do recognize one another after death, but I think they're worthy of looking at at least to establish uh, the suggestion that there is recognition of one another after death. Question or comments? I'm going to move into some positive examples here after we look after we've looked at these. Question or comments on these? Hey, a phrase, and we've looked at this before, of peculiar significance, uh, especially re relevant to our study now, occurs in connection with the record of Abraham's death. Uh, turn to Genesis 25. Uh, Genesis 25, and let's see, uh, Karen, if you would, read verse 7 and 8 for us. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived. A hundred three score and fifteen years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man, and full of years, and was gathered to his people. The phrase we're looking at is, and was gathered to his people. And we've looked at this uh, before in our, in our studies. And won't take time to read it, but it also occurs with respect to Ishmael's death there in verse 17. Uh, also with respect to the death of Isaac in chapter 35 and verse 29. Well, we, we will take uh, a moment to read that passage uh, because uh, as I mentioned before, there's a footnote that I have here and maybe you have it also uh, trying to help us to understand uh, what this gathered to his people may have reference to. Uh, Pat, you want to read Genesis 35 and verse 9? Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. And yeah, I said nine, but you're right. Yeah. Twenty-nine. You got it right. <laughs> Isaac breathed his last. Because I was looking at it, and that wasn't the right passage. Because I said nine, but it's verse uh, verse uh, twenty-nine, as you read. Uh, my uh, New King James Version has a footnote gathered to his people, and I've mentioned this before. Joined his ancestors, uh, indicating that being the idea, the concept uh, that's here. Uh, the phrase also used. Uh, won't read it with respect uh, to uh, Jacob uh, in Genesis forty-nine verse 29 and verse 33. And we will read the uh, reference in Deuteronomy 32 uh, where it's used with reference to Moses and also Aaron. And uh, uh, Jack, if you would, read Deuteronomy 32, verse 48 through 50. 50. The Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up to this mountain of the Abraham, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite Jericho, and look at the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the sons of Israel for a possession. Then die on the mountain where you ascend, and be gathered to your people, as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people. And here's another place where uh, at least my, trans, my, my Bible has this a footnote again, gather to his people, join your ancestors. Uh, again, trying to explain what is involved here. And uh, the phrase uh, we talked about this before, gather to his people, uh, cannot properly be understood as referring to the burial of their bodies. That's contention of some. It's just saying that uh, Abraham and uh, Moses and, uh, and Aaron, all these individuals, uh, their bodies were buried and their ancestors' bodies were buried before them, and so that's all that is being referred to here. But uh, take Moses as an example. We know about Moses. Uh, Moses was buried in a secret place in the valley in the land of Moab. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 6 states that. His body was buried in a secret place. Uh, and that was far from the tombs of his fathers. 
uh, his fathers were in another land all uh, all together. So it gathered to his people can't refer to his body uh, being in the grave. The reference must be to his spirit and his spirit's reunion with the spirits of his ancestors gone on before. Another example is Jacob. Uh, Jacob it said was gathered to his people. We didn't read it there, but it's in that Genesis 49 uh, passage. Uh, Jacob was gathered to his people while he was in the land of Egypt, remember? And thus long before his body was carried back to Canaan, according to his wish, and entombed in the soil of his homeland. Uh, so it just seems certain in light of these facts that the phrase gathered to his people refers not to the fact of death nor to the grave but to a reunion of the spirit with those who've gone on before. And here's the main point of all this, that reunion has significance only if one is able to recognize his people. Uh, what's the significance of being gathered to your people after death if you can't recognize this is your people? Uh, these are your ancestors. Uh, that's the point of looking at this phrase, gathered to his people, uh, join their ancestors. Questions or comments on this phrase uh, that I'm contending suggests recognition after death. Something that along about in our past studies I thought was interesting here, it says uh, be presently, you know, being gathered to your people. So whenever you thought you're going to be gathered to your people, but then it says, just as Aaron, your brother, and then he says, was gathered, as if that already happened. Yeah. yeah. So you, we, we studied in the past, when yeah. does that happen? Well, it looks like, it looks like well, Aaron <coughs> was gathered, so he's, in the pre he's presently gathered with his people, and now when you die, you're going to be gathered. Yeah, your Not, people. And that doesn't seem like in the future. It seems like it's going to happen now, just because was already happened, and now... Right. When you die, you're going to do the same thing. Right. Good, uh, good point, I think, on that. I see that also in the, in, in the passage, at least. Uh, at least the illusion that that is the case, for sure. Uh, to these examples, I think we can add Samuel also, uh, who was recognized uh, by, uh, after his death, uh, was recognized by Saul. Uh, we've looked at this passage before also in the course of our studies here. Look at 1 Samuel chapter uh, 28, and let's see, we'll, we'll break this reading up a little bit. Uh, Florence, you want to read verse 3 through 10, and then Mindy, verse 11 through 19. Okay. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Sh Shunem. So Paul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And that, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by the Urim of the, by, or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, "Find me a woman who is medium." Then I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is, is a medium at Eldor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went and two, men, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know that Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. And everything that was mispronounced, I'm sorry. <laughs> then the woman asked, Who shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. 
Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, Why do you consult me? Now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy, the Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. And this scene here, you're aware about reading this, uh, uh, the Philistines are ready to attack. And uh, Saul, uh, he's uh, needless, uh, the le he's disturbed, he's afraid of what's going to take place. And adding to that fear is God hasn't answered him uh, through prophets of Aram, uh, which uh, would reveal God's will in the case, whether to attack, whether to flee, that type of thing. Uh, plus, added to that, as the text says, Saul had already put the mediums and spirits out of the land, so uh, he didn't want them in the land, so he had to disguise himself then uh, to go to this one uh, medium uh, at Endor and try to find somebody uh, that would tell him what to do. Some representative of the Lord uh, would tell him what to do. So he asked this medium, this um, this witch of Endor, to call up Samuel. And Samuel appears. And it appears to me that the woman, uh, uh, she was surprised that Samuel did appear in verse 12. Uh, when mm -hmm. the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. Uh, she and. Uh, uh, was taken back by the appearance of Samuel. Uh, and then she realized that it was Saul that was doing this, and Saul had deceived her uh, in, into this. Now, verse 13, uh, the king, uh, Saul, he said, Don't be afraid. What did you see? The woman said, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. And then Saul said to her, What is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. Well, Saul perceived right away that it was Samuel. He recognized uh, Samuel. Now, she saw a spirit, but she describes the form of this spirit, and the form of this spirit is the appearance of Samuel. I don't know how all this took place. I mentioned that last week on things. Just using it as an example of the possibility that there is such a thing as recognition after death. Yes, Jack? Well, we keep getting examples of them, recognize people that, that maybe they know, but I, I, I'm curious about the whole point being, will we recognize our loved ones? Will we rejoin with our loved ones? Is that the point? Well, we'll look at that in the New Testament passages here in a moment on things. Uh, I'm going to show passages that uh, suggest that yes, we do on things. Uh, so that, far, that's what this is all about. We'll know, Rick, we'll know Moses, we'll know Elijah, we'll know Jesus Christ, but will I know my wife? I'm, uh, I'm going to show some passages that I, su that I believe suggest we will know our loved ones that we will on things. Uh, now, you, you, you look at the passages as we go through them on things, and you see if they suggest the same thing on thing, uh, on it. But I'm going to show passages that I believe indicate that, yes, we will know uh, not just Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, but also our loved ones um, and beyond death. Gene? It seems to me in this example that recognition there because God had a hand in raising the person. In this case, exactly. So that's an example. That is an okay. example there. Not that we will see somebody, but rather in this particular instance, they recognize it because God mm -hmm. had a hand in raising yeah. it. And, and I concur, that's exactly right in these cases. Uh, and we're going to see that in the next one uh, when we go to the New Testament, the Mount of Transfiguration. They recognize uh, Moses and Elijah. But yes, indeed, God had a hand in that. Uh, and, and I acknowledge that. But then we're going to proceed from there to other passages that, again, I'm saying suggest that we recognize our loved ones also 
uh, in the world to come, if you will, on things. Uh, we're just looking at some passages building up to the possibility of recognition after death. We see these individuals uh, were recognized after death. God, yes, having a hand in some of these cases, I uh, acknowledge that. But there's other passages. Yes. I think it's interesting that you have to put in he is covered with a mantle. I mean, almost like he's recognized by what he was wearing too. Well, Not just by that's his true. appearance, but what he was wearing. Well, apparently a mantle was uh, uh, the uh, known attire of prophets at that time. So that was a, a signal that... Uh, uh, that he had the sign of a prophet. Let's put it that way, the sign of a prophet, the man of man. That's true. Other questions or comments on these Old Testament passages? Let's move on to some New Testament passages uh, here and um, uh, see what some of these other passages <clears throat> may suggest in answering our question whether or not we'll know one another, recognize one another after death. Uh, first note the account of Moses and Elijah, who very clearly were recognized here on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, dear, you want to read Matthew 17, 1 through 5? Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Okay, you've got Jesus there, of course. You've got Peter, James, and John there. And verse 3 says, Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him, talking with, with Jesus. He, he, they, Moses and Elijah appeared to Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. And Moses and Elijah are talking with him. Luke's account in Luke chapter 9 and verse 31 says that Moses and Elijah appeared in glory to them. Now Jesus, he's appearing in a glorified state also, but so is Moses and Elijah. Uh, uh, Moses and Elijah are appearing to Peter, James, and John as they are, I contend, in the spiritual realm. Now, According to what I indicated before, I believe that the spiritual realm they're in right now is heaven. Uh, but they're appearing in this spiritual realm, whatever the spiritual realm might be, with the glory which the redeemed have in that spiritual realm. They appeared to them, to Peter, James, and John, in glory. Now, I can't explain all there is about that appearance in glory, uh, but just citing the passage to indicate that there's some way in which uh, the possibility there is recognition of people who've gone on before, recognition of people after that. Other than a human form. Uh, right, right. Now, uh, and I mentioned that last week also. Uh, whenever we think of this, we think of uh, recognizing one another in the bodies we have now. Well, we're going to show some passages that uh, our bodies are going to be changed. So we're not talking about recognition necessarily in the bodies we have now on, on things, but recognition of the, the spiritual being that, we're, uh, that is going to be our makeup in the world, in the world to come on things. That's a good point, too, Jack. Was, was Peter and John and James, they were alive? Yes, yes, in this well, case, different. yeah. yeah that's, that's different. I'm saying that's different. Well, it, that's yeah. a, that that is a vision. That is the transfiguration. A vision. We're talking about uh, no, exactly. if we're in heaven, yeah. will we know our people? I, I realize that, and uh, that's why I said we're just looking at a series of passages building up to this. Let's move on to some more passages as, as we go here in a, in a moment and see if it's still if it's possible at least that 
will recognize even our loved ones on things. And this is another passage, like Gene said before, with respect to Samuel, God had a hand of this, and God can make Moses and Elijah appear in whatever form he wants, and God could miraculously have uh, done something to Peter, James, and John so they'd recognize Moses and Elijah. I acknowledge all that. I acknowledge all, all that on things. Uh, this case is different uh, from those perspectives, at least. But I'm just citing these passages, building up to, again, the possibility uh, that we recognize one another, recognize even our loved ones <clears throat> after death has occurred. Did I see another hand up? Question or comment on this one? Uh, remember the uh, account of the rich man and Lazarus? <clears throat> Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. We won't read all of it. We've looked at it several times. Uh, Debbie, you want to read verse, uh, no, just 23 and 24. We'll do it. And beginning in torments and Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now keep in mind, both the rich man and Lazarus' body were in the grave. Their bodies were in the grave. Both of them had died, the account says. Uh, and the body without the spirit is dead. So both of their bodies were dead. Their spirits had gone into the uh, realm of uh, where spirits are after death. Their spirits were alive, we pointed out in previous uh, studies. Their spirits were conscious, as this indicates. And it appears to me that in, in respect to the rich man at least, uh, he recognized uh, Abraham, he recognized also Lazarus. Uh, verse uh, 23, being in torments in Hades, the rich man lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, as far as I know, according to the account, uh, the rich man never had a personal uh, living association with Abraham. He did have a living personal relationship, you want to call that, with Lazarus. Uh, because Lazarus was eating crumbs uh, from the phone from his table on things. Um, but the point I'm trying to bring out in the passage, the rich man recognized both Abraham and Lazarus in this spiritual realm, in this spiritual realm. Abraham was dead, Lazarus was dead, the rich man, uh, their bodies were dead, but their spirits were still alive and recognizable in some way or another. Questions or comments on this passage and what we're trying to show from it? Look at Matthew chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 11 through verse 12. Isaac, you want to read that for us? And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, <coughs> and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The sons of but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into uh, outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You notice in the context there, Jesus is commending this uh, centurion for his faith. Uh, he uh, had great faith, uh, such great faith that he had, Jesus said he hadn't even seen uh, in Israel among those that supposed to have been having great faith uh, because of uh, their knowledge of God's word and God's will in times past. But point of looking at this passage, references made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The recognition of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would increase the joys of those present and also the dismay of those cast into the outer darkness. Uh, point is, how would the many, see many, will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven? How would those many that Jesus refers to that have great faith 
like this centurion manifested, how would they know that they were sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if they weren't able to recognize who they're sitting down with? That's my point of the passage. And how would they know? And how would their joy in this relationship uh, be enhanced uh, if they didn't even know, didn't even uh, have the ability to recognize them? Or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob aren't recognizable. They're not recognizable in some way or another. One thing. Now again, whenever we think of this, we think of recognizing someone in their physical body. On things, I'm not suggesting that at all. On things, recognizing one another in some way or another in that spiritual realm. On things, it appears from this passage. Questions or comments on this one? Yes, Jean. Sight or seeing someone who God has provided is not necessarily something which is done by the natural eye. That's either. true. That's true. And that's a, that is a miraculous circumstance which mm -hmm. is prepared by God for a particular reason. Mm -hmm. Not just to recognize somebody who's mm -hmm. gone for you, but rather or, or it's the, the transformation is such that the whole process is miraculous. Right. No, that's a good point on things. And that lends again to what I'm saying about uh, uh, number one, I, I, I won't even attempt to try to explain how this happens because it's in the spiritual realm and we don't have a revelation on it. Uh, but also number two, um, I think we think of this in terms of seeing in the physical sense of seeing that fleshly body across uh, the way someplace in that spiritual realm. And uh, uh, I'm not contending that that is the case. Uh, seeing, uh, knowing, somehow or another, uh, that uh, that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, that's sitting over there. And we're one of the many who have this great faith. Uh, and now we're joyously in the presence of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, sitting conversing with them, whatever, just an enjoying relationship with them. Yeah, Pat. <clears throat> As I listen to you, it comes to me that the only way we can know these people is to have known about them through the scriptures and know their <coughs> demeanor. There's mm -hmm. certain things that will distinguish them and make them well known to you. Just like I would know my husband because he is well known to me, even if he doesn't look the same. I'm going to know him when I, uh, it's, it's spiritual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, we, and, and we, we've, we're just beginning now then to look at some passages uh, to, uh, to address what Jack is uh, uh, talking about uh, a moment ago. Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob may understand that, comprehend that, but what about our personal loved ones, uh, people we have a relationship with in this life? The next few passages I'm going to be addressing that on things. Questions or comments on this one yet? Yeah. Well, yes, Jean. Sometimes when we say I see, what you're doing is reflecting something that's in your mind. That's right. Yeah. You can say, you know, I can sit here and I can see so-so sitting on the porch. Mm -hmm. And you can't because that person did that for years. But in your mind that has, if you've retained that memory and to you, it's seeing it. That's right. So I think in a sense, seeing uh, the historical characters like you're talking about here, are because um, they've studied about them, they read about them, they know about them through uh, their own documents and so forth. And so in that sense, the mind's eye sees them. Yeah. Uh, and I would prefer the term uh, not necessarily seeing physically seeing, as you're talking about, but recognizing on things. Uh, that this is who this is, uh, by, by whatever characteristics God has there for us to be able to recognize them. That's the reason I said the mind's eye. Yeah, the mind's eye, that's right. Yeah, I concur, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, and that gets into an explanation as to how, and uh, I think it's a, it's a powerful <coughs> explanation on things, but I'm uh, not prepared to delve into all of the hows that this is going to take place. Uh, let's look uh, here, and that was the first bell here. Let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. 
uh, let's see here. Uh, did you ever read Isaac? Yeah, I read it. Okay, yeah. back to Donna then, if you would. First Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. For what is our hope or joy, our crown of rejoicing? It is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming, for you are, you are our glory and joy. And then before I comment on that, Karen, would you read 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 through 15? Okay. <clears throat> Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the off-scouring of all things unto this day. I write... Not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though we have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. I think you may be 1 Corinthians Am 4. I in the wrong? Did you say 2 yeah. Corinthians? 2 Corinthians. What have I got up? 2 Corinthians 4. Oh. Sounds like you're in 1 Corinthians 4. I am. Okay. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> That's all right. Second Corinthians four thirteen through fifteen, please. I didn't think it sounded exactly right. <laughs> um, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. Okay, here's my argument, my contention, with respect to both of these passages. Uh, the first Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20 passage, and also 2 Corinthians 4, verse 14 specifically. Both of these passages reveal Paul's hope, his expectation of being with his converts at Christ's coming. Will present us with you. He who raised Jesus from dead will present us, the Apostle Paul, with you, the Corinthians. Recognizing them in the presence of Jesus would be a source of great joy for Paul. Paul expected to experience joy in the life to come because of the faithfulness and devotion of those to whom he'd preached, among whom he'd labored. Uh, the manner of his realization of such rejoicing is answered here in verse, in verse 14. He who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. How would Paul know? How would Paul know that his converts there at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 2 passage, and here at Corinth, how would he know that they were present with Jesus if he wasn't able to recognize them or they were not recognizable in some way or another? It just doesn't make sense to believe that these who were, were to be raised and would be that they themselves also be total and utter strangers to Paul, and, and he to them. Uh, now think about them, uh, the converts there at Corinth and the converts there at Thessalonica. Uh, the Apostle Paul is the one that labored among them, taught them the gospel. Uh, they were faithful and obedient to the gospel, and God now blessed them with uh, the heavenly home. And uh, Paul's up here someplace or another, but they have no way in the world of recognizing him and no way of him recognizing uh, them. The, the words will present us with you appear to signify more than the mere gathering of unfamiliar personalities is what I'm suggesting from the passage. Now that we're not done yet, uh, the, the, the crowning one to me is the next one. First Thessalonians in chapter 4 and verse 13 through verse 18. So if you have looked at it, well, look at it uh, before we get to it next week. Yes, Jim. That's one reason it seems to me that Paul said he preferred all things to be better when we die to be with Christ. He preferred to stay 
because of the good that he would do to those he would teach. He was recognized for that statement, that he was going to have an effect and be, and be able to know who they were, that he was, uh, that he, that he was teaching. And, and all that's a possibility on things. Just uh, uh, he's saying now, you know, that's uh, basically his hopes are there, and not makes it, maybe he's not saying that uh, he uh, is going to actually see them in the presence of God. I acknowledge all that. Uh, we're building up, though, to the crowning one, First Thessalonians in chapter 4, 13 through 18, and I believe lends to, again, Jack's uh, uh, statement about, well, will we recognize our loved ones here. Will we recognize our loved ones here? So look at that passage and see what you think before we look at it next Lord's Day morning. Jack, you have a question. Point, if we don't know anyone, what's the big deal about wanting to go? See, to me, the possibility that we will know our loved ones, know, well, we know we're not going to know Jesus, we'll look at passages there for sure on things, know that we're going to recognize Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all these Old Testament worthies, and Paul, and Peter, and uh, be able to uh, re relate to their suffering in this life uh, with Christ on behalf of the gospel, and revealing the God. It just enhances, to me, the hope of that heavenly home. Good question. Good question. Really good. Just getting really good. The bell rang. <laughs> you know, just the point. If you don't, if you don't even know anyone up there that you care for down here, why do you want to go up there? Be with Jesus. Well, you don't want to go down here. More important to be with Jesus. I was asking. Yeah. Alternative. Right? Yeah. 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 The whole point was. I don't know. That's still there's a lot of answers. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's bad. Yeah, 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 we get that. Okay. <laughs> I'll get the class. One of those things you can say. I don't want to go there. <laughs> Always good. Oh, sad, sad, sad. <laughs> that is not a good place. And be with all those. Well, I don't want to go down there. We would be with ISIS. I don't want to go down there, but I don't know anybody either. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to be by myself down there. You and me by yourself, believe me. I thought that about people I know. If there's no one no. I know, I don't want to go. <laughs> Yeah, you know, go down there and find somebody, but you're going to be in trouble. Well, there may be somebody down there I'm trying to get away from. Too, right? If we have other pictures, you might not look like that again. Oh, I just think about something. Yeah, maybe that's why. That doesn't describe my beliefs one way or the other. You think you're more interested because you may not know. You're not paying attention to my beliefs.
So just having a hope now to know that you're going to go where you're going to know the people that you want to care for. Yeah, I just now. don't want to find out if there's somebody there I wanted there. <laughs> That's the part I don't want. Yeah, I, I, I want to know the ones that I know, but I don't want to know that the ones I knew are not there. Yeah. But we'll talk about think, that, too. Yeah, that's, that's one of the objections. We'll talk about that. Some of them we dwell in there and I don't think about yeah. it, so yeah. you're going to have to really enlighten me on that because I don't think about that. Well, story. bottom line, and I, and I, I, I have it in the outline, bottom line, God's going to take care of that, I believe. Okay, well, God, I'm just he's going to wipe away all tears on things, which would indicate yes. that he'd wipe right. away uh, any of those kind of thoughts on things. But uh, we'll, we'll address that, too. That's one of the main really, objections. That's really how we have to handle it. Well, trust him. He that is not going to, God is love. Yeah. We surround ourselves with love, you know, we'll be full of love. So I can't imagine, you know. We're, we're not going to know that there, but that's, that would be something I wouldn't want to know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know.